The panel is joined to the frame so that shafts and controls can be properly placed. This is the extension shaft to the band switch. By the use of this band switch connected to the exciter and driver stages, it's possible to change frequencies very rapidly. That's vitally important in military operation. The final amplifier tuning condenser assembly was built as a unit on the feeder table. It is placed carefully in position. Before this radio frequency deck joins the main assembly line, the standoffs are added. The exciter to modulator cable is hooked up. The neutralizing condenser is mounted on the standoffs. The main tube socket is added. Here are the antenna binding posts through which passes the output of the transmitter. This unit is now carefully inspected before it moves into main assembly. Every element, no matter how large or small, is inspected and tested before it goes into a transmitter. When the radio frequency deck joins the main assembly here, the big job is nearly done. A steady flow of finished units has been made possible by intelligent planning of the work at all Hallicrafters plants, perfect coordination with the suppliers and subcontractors, and hundreds of skilled and tireless hands. Now the relays are covered. The smaller tubes are set in place and the completed unit is ready to leave the assembly line. The transmitter is now ready for the first of many tests it will receive before it earns the stamp of final approval. This is the electrical testing room where the transmitter's output, modulation and keying are accurately measured and recorded. This work calls for plenty of technical skill and knowledge so the staff here is principally made up of experienced radio amateurs. Signal Corps inspectors watch closely these important steps in controlling both the quality and performance of the transmitter. This test measures the radio frequency output of the transmitter. Instead of allowing the signal to radiate over an antenna, these bulbs, called the dummy antenna, convert the RF output into heat. Another important test is the one made for overload. The purpose of this is to make sure the relays respond properly to protect the circuits. This is also done to determine the capacity of the entire transmitter to absorb a temporary overload in normal operation without breaking down. Next, the transmitter is given a trial at sending code signals. When operated in this manner, the audio amplifier and modulator are not used. The flashing of these rectifier tubes shows how the key simply makes and breaks the output to form the characters of the telegraph code. To check how well the transmitter responds to all essential voice frequencies, the oscillograph is used. This detects any distortion and locates at what point the distortion occurs. This transmitter shows a normal frequency response. When the lid goes on the transmitter, that means it has passed all the electrical tests with an A1 rating. It's ready now for the signal core truck. In another part of the plant, radio receivers are being mounted on a table assembly that makes up the listening end of this communication unit. Each table is equipped with two similar radio receivers. One operates on the main power supply and the other from an auxiliary battery. The entire assembly is tested for proper operation as a unit. The two receivers can be operated simultaneously. This is the speech amplifier. 
two separate operating positions are provided. Part of the table assembly includes two loudspeakers, two field telephone instruments, and a portable typewriter. This is the final step in assembly, bringing the transmitter, the receivers, and the accessories together and installing them in the truck. Once the equipment is mounted inside this door, it becomes officially the SCR-299. It's on the way to the front. Easy does it. There's no room to spare here, and there's plenty more to be put in. Every inch of space is accounted for in this truck, and these men know how to use it. A place for everything, and everything goes right into place quickly and securely. While the transmitter is being bolted to the floor, the table assembly with its receiving equipment moves in. Accuracy in design and construction makes it possible to save many valuable hours throughout the entire production and assembly of the unit. There goes the wall cabinet that holds the additional operating parts, extra coils, tuning units, condensers. And here's the bench that contains the tools and spare parts, a radio man's hope chest. And this is what it looks like when the operators step in. At the far end, the transmitter with the antenna tuner on top of it. On the right, the wall cabinet. On the floor, the long bench for the operators. Both of these are storehouses for parts and accessories. On the left wall of the truck, the operator's table with two receivers, speech amplifier, control panel, and below, an electric heater and the two field telephones. There goes the SCR-299, out into the field to make its final test on the air. There's just one thing missing. Where's the power coming from? The signal core provides for that in a portable gasoline-driven generator that rides in this trailer behind each truck. This generator supplies standard lighting current, 117 volts AC. A transmitter and receiver that operate on this current can be hooked in to power almost anywhere. Here is the mobile power supply. A remote control from the truck to the generator makes it possible to start and stop the generator at will. The operator prepares for the air test. His first call is to Central Control Station. WXYK, WXYK4, calling for a check on the quality of this transmission and standing by. And here is communication going off to war. Over these ramps roll hundreds of units that will carry the voice of victory to every corner of the earth. Like the champion thoroughbred it is, the SCR-299 rates a whole boxcar to itself. This signal core unit is built for action and to get into action fast. It's a highly mobile radio station and may be set up almost anywhere in battle or invasion activities. Speed is vital. Every minute counts. The enemy doesn't wait. Communications must be ready at all times. It may be the only contact over which a blow-by-blow -blow report flashes from the local front to the remote commands at Cairo, London, Sydney. The SCR-299 in this position is the nerve center of all our attacking forces. Artillery, tanks, infantry, air force, 
many of which are widely separated. Through the transmitter flow the reports, information, timing, and the order to advance. This is the voice of victory. Contact may be made with an approaching flight of bombers while they're still hundreds of miles away from the target. To coordinate their attack perfectly, these flyers must know the present position of our own tanks, infantry, artillery. They get this information by contact with the message center, which speaks and listens through the SCR-299. Tanks moving into position must be kept informed of the approaching air support. Timing is vital. And the timing of all these movements is controlled through this voice by direct contact with the Armored Forces Headquarters. From many small stations scattered miles apart along the battlefronts comes the flash news, the observations, the unexpected, all clearing through this central station. That's how radio helps to time these big movements, make them strike most effectively and with the minimum loss of American lives. Radio communication units are among the first pieces of equipment to go into action, whether the attack is on land or sea. Radio communications stay in the fight as long as there are men, guns, ships and tanks on the move. For the life, death or victory of all of them depend upon this command. Get the message through. Perhaps one of the most important messages ever issued is the one you're about to hear from Major General Harry C. Ingalls, Chief Signal Officer of the United States Army. General Ingalls. I'm speaking now as one American soldier to another. For we in the armed forces regard each of you men and women in this audience as being one of us and working shoulder to shoulder with us. You and you alone are responsible for the production and performance of this vital piece of communication equipment. You have seen enough to know what good communication equipment means to the men out there and what it means to victory. You have done a splendid job. Keep up the good work you have been doing. We are asking millions of American soldiers to stake their lives on breaking Germany and Japan. They ask you to keep up your production to the limit of your ability and the high standards of workmanship that have given us an advantage over the enemy that can be measured only on the day of final victory.